Father, today we're thankful that we can be here. And God, as we continue watching what's going on in, in this early, early church, in the first century church, in the, the very early stages of this thing we call church. Again, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and touch our hearts. Lord, we, we look at this and we then begin to understand that the same problems that we have are the same problems that they had. And it's because we all live in this body of flesh. And Lord, I know we're coming from a lot of different areas. And, and Lord, we've got to fight against the flesh. And so I pray as we look and watch and get a glimpse into the way they handled things. And Lord, the way they went about things. That it would, again, encourage us. Give us wisdom in our own situ situations and circumstances. Give us wisdom in the difficulties and the, the victories that we have in our lives so that, God, we can be the men and women that you see us as. And I thank you so much for the gift of salvation. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who makes your word come alive to us. And so God, again, bless this time in Jesus' name, amen. As we're watching the church, it is interesting as we think about the way that the attacks have come, or we might even just say, we might even say it this way, the discouragement towards the church. Remember in the very beginning after the day of Pentecost and people were kind of happy, remember the first thing was the religious people said, you need to stop what you're doing. It's not cool. Remember that? Kind of paraphrasing. Stop it. Just quit doing it. And they decided not to. Then they heal the guy. Then uh, the, after they heal the guy, they get talked to again. And then they have that kind of attack from within the church where we have Ananias and Sapphira who kind of held back the money and so now you got problems within the church and people causing problems within the church. Although, God took care of that one, didn't he? That one's kind of like, boom, that got taken care of. Then they got arrested again, and then they got beaten. So you have this entity coming against you. You have problems within the church. And then the, the third attack is you, you just have some persecution. Now today, we're gonna look at Kind of, the, one, of the, one of the last attacks, although it goes on and on and on, but one of the strategies of Satan, and this strategy to me, I think is the most crucial for us to be aware of. And this strategy is to cause division in the church. You know, the old saying, divide and conquer. That's what we're kind of gonna watch Satan try and do. And we're gonna see the early church take a stand and use wisdom against that that I pray would be deep, deeply embedded in our hearts. The worst thing the church can do is divide. And divide over dumb things. I understand when we have to divide over true doctrinal issues, but dumb things. And they come up and then you get factions and you get things going on and we have to be aware of that. So listen, I, I believe, I believe we're, we're looking and, and you see during tremendous growth and, and tremendous spiritual activity comes these kind of subtle attacks, kind of sneaky coming at you. So in verse one, it says, now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying. Now, I want to just stop there and talk about that for a moment because that's pretty cool, right? We're talking about that. Remember in the last chapter, there was subtraction. We got rid of two, right? And a little bit of subtraction. And I love when God subtracts, he does generally multiply. He doesn't add. He begins multiplying. And we talked about it at the end of chapter five, how they, there was multitudes coming. And now during that time when he's multiplying, guess what, man? Now comes I think the sneakiest of all of the ta attacks, the most covert, if you will, kind of undercover, not right in your face, not real blatant, but sneaky. And listen, it says, as they were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neg neglected in the daily distribution. 
Now that's kind of a difficult, listen, that last part's kind of a difficult interpretation. And some of your different translations might say, you know, the Hebrew speakers by against the Greek speakers and, and et cetera. We're going we're gonna to kind of get into that in a moment. But first of all, I want you to notice there arose a complaint. A better translation would be there arose murmuring. That is like the, the killer in a church, murmuring. It's the same exact word that was used in the Septuagint. You guys know what the Septuagint is. It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's the same Greek word that they used in the Septuagint when they talked about the group who came against Moses and they were murmuring. Remember in the wilderness, they're murmuring. Here's what murmuring sounds like. And then when anybody walks up on the that can do anything about it, it's like this. And it gets real quiet. Because murmurs love to murmur. They don't want to get things taken care of. They love to murmur. They love to complain. And you get this stirring going on. So here we have, though, we have a legitimate thing going on. But there's murmuring about it. Listen, there can be some legitimate situations that need to be taken care of. But murmuring never settles anything. It's this. You want to get something settled? Go to somebody who can do something about it. And talk to them. And discuss it. So what we have here, when it talks about the Hebrews, listen, you had, you had a couple factions in, in, in uh, Jerusalem at that time specifically. And especially because, remember, we're celebrating. We're in the day of Pentecost or right after that. So you have people who have come from all over to celebrate that. So you had Jews who were Jews who were Jews who spoke Hebrew, who kept the Jewish tradition. Everything about them was Jewishness. And you had that faction. Well, some of them are getting saved. And then you had Jews who came from outside of Israel, and they had kind of adopted not just the Greek language, but the Greek culture. And they had become more Greek than Jew, except in their religious practice. And it seems like what was going on is, because the Old Testament was very clear about taking care of widows, right? You guys remember that part of your Old Testament? So it tells them to take care of widows. So listen, it seemed like that was a carryover into the church, which is a good thing. And they were trying to take care of the widows, but it seems like somebody got the idea that the, the uh, Hellenists, the, the more Greek Jewish ladies, widows, were not being taken care of like the Hebrew ladies. So here's what happened. Why didn't somebody go to somebody? Well, finally somebody does, but, but you kind of get the point. So listen, there could have been, and here's what I love, man, there could have been this huge split in the church. That part I don't love. But there was a potential for a huge split. And then we're going to have, you know, the the first church in Jerusalem of the Hebrews and the first church of the Jerusalem of of the Hellenists, and we're not going to get together and we're not going to do what we're supposed to do. Do you understand as Christians we're all the same? Look around. We're all the same. We don't all look the same, but we're all the same, man. We're brothers and sisters. I was doing something the other day, and someone was with me, and the, and the person said, hey, you know, is, is that a relative? And I said, yeah, it is. And they go, really? You guys kind of don't look alike. And I go, he's my brother. And they go, really? And so <laughs> then I got to tell them about Jesus. But listen, <laughs> listen, we're, we're in this together. And we need to know that, and we need to understand that. We're doing something together. And if there's an issue, if there's a situation we need to take care of, let's take care of it. So listen, this all arose, and then it tells us in verse 2, then the 12 summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it is not good or it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So it gets to the twelve. It's interesting, this is the last time they're called the 12. But it gets to the 12. You have these 12 apostles who are teaching the church. Most even conservative scholars say by this time in the book of Acts, the church was around 20,000 people. Is that incredible? You know what we call that today, don't we? We call it a mega church, right? We look at churches, man, if a church hit 20,000, we're thinking, that's humongous. That's what the early church did in a couple months. That's insanity. So you have the 12 are ministering to all of these people, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming. You know, sometimes churches are criticized for growing. 
What is a church that's growing supposed to do? Listen, if you're a healthy church and you're growing, which we should be, and we're growing, and people go, you're getting too big. We were accused of that a couple times. And I said, well, what do you want us to do? Lock the doors? Sorry, you can't come. We don't want you. And they're growing like crazy. And so here's what the, here's what the apostles do, man. I love their wisdom. They get the people together and they go, you need to understand something. It's not desirable, nor is it a good thing for us to leave the ministry that we're called to, to wait on tables. Now, I want to make something clear. They weren't saying, we're above waiting on tables. You know who we are. We're the apostles. We live that kind of work to the apostles. You know, I mean, listen, they weren't, they weren't in any way even insinuating that. Here's what they're saying. That's not our calling. Our calling is to teach the word. Later on, we're gonna read, they say, we can't leave praying, studying, and giving out the word. We can't leave that to do this. If we don't do what we're called to do, the church is gonna fail. But listen carefully. If somebody doesn't do what they're called to do, the church is gonna fail. This is all called serving. Listen, all of us, no matter what we're doing, we're serving the Lord. I serve the Lord through a teaching ministry because that's what God has given me. That's what he's called me to do. Some serve the Lord through singing and playing instruments. Some serve the Lord through children's ministry. Some serve the Lord through greeting and ushering and getting people seated. Some serve the Lord, and I could go on and on and on and on in, in different ministries. But listen carefully. We are all serving the Lord and serving the church and causing the church to be healthy and growing. And if any of us aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing, we're not going to have a healthy church. Here's a kind of a cool thing to think about. Do you remember when Jesus walked on, on earth, the stories we have in the Gospels? Did he have a limp? I don't think so. Didn't mention it, did he? Did he have a palsy arm that didn't work? No. Nope. Have one eye blind? Ear that fell off? Nose that doesn't work? I'm being a little crazy, huh? Well, if his physical body didn't do that, why does his spiritual body tend to do that? You see, the body of Christ often has a palsy arm or a limp or an eye that's not working. Listen, we're all, we're in this together. And we need to see that the word of God is spread, but in that word of God being spread that we're gonna read about at the end of this, we need to all be doing our part in order for that to happen. There's only one way that's gonna happen, and by us being the body of Christ. So here's what these guys say. You need to understand something. We know our calling. We know what we're called to. We're called to give the word of God. You know, and it's a shame when that doesn't happen. Listen, you watch churches and you watch ministries and when they get away from giving out the word of God, what happens to that ministry, man? Bad doctrine creeps in, strange things creeps in. So let's think about this for a moment. What was the strategy of the enemy here? It wasn't just to split the church. His strategy was, if I can get those apostles sidetracked from what they're really called to do, I can destroy this church before it ever gets going because the word of God is not gonna get in the hearts of the people and they're gonna get messed up. So I'll just get them waiting tables. And the apostles are filled with the spirit and they go, hey guys, that's not what we're called to do. There are some here called to do that, but we're not called to do that. We're called to give the word. And you know, I, I think that's a lesson for all of us. We need to understand that because some, some churches, they want their pastor to do everything or pastors. You guys need to do everything. You're the professionals. I've heard that. And I'm not very professional. So that's kind of a bogus statement. But listen, you guys, no. The work of the ministry is all of us, right? My main job, according to Ephesians, is to equip the saints, listen carefully, to do the work of the ministry. So these guys are going, man, if we do that, things are gonna get messed up. But here's what I love, they know the solution. So it's not desirable for us to leave the ministry that we're called to, to do somebody else's ministry. Kind of keep that, you know, kind of translate it that way. That's not a good thing, and it's never a good thing. Listen, if you do somebody's ministry and a ministry that you're not called to do and you're not gifted to do, you know what's gonna happen? I guarantee you, you will burn out. I read all the time about Christian burnout. Where I don't ever read about Christian burnout is in the Bible. 
all these guys are serving. Do you ever read Paul's little autobiography there in 2 Corinthians where he talks about the things he did and he never went, man, I got so stinking tired, I took a sabbatical. He didn't even know what a sabbatical was, poor guy. But why didn't he burn out? Because he was doing what God called him to do by the power of the Spirit of God, and you can keep going. You're like an energizer bunny. You go and you go and you go. That, again, that doesn't mean that you just work people to death. So then, listen, then they called them together, said, it's not desirable that we do this. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom who we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. So once again, they emphasize that's what we're called to. And you know what? I, I, I watch some people, and you know what? If you're not praying and studying, you're not gonna give the ministry of the word. You may get up and give a good speech. You may get up and, and be a good communicator, but if you're not praying and studying, it's all for naught. It's useless. There was a Calvary guy a couple years ago. I was on an email server thing, and not Hillary's, but a different one. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Just slipped. Oops. So, so uh, this guy, <laughs> wow. I really hope that doesn't go on the radio, but anyway. <laughs> so. So this guy, this, this guy, he's talking, and, and here's what he said. This, like, broke my heart. Here's what he said. I just finished teaching, you know, one of the last books of the Bible, so I taught all the way through the Bible. Here's what, and this is what he said. So I don't have to study anymore. Yeah, thank you for gasping, because that's what I did. I said, what do you mean? You know, this is probably the fourth time, maybe, that I've taught through Acts. Maybe not four, maybe third. Do you know I'm studying it more now than I was when I first started? Because I want to get more in depth. I want to learn more. And then here's the thing. Every time, like, I would like right now to stop and go back and start in chapter one again. Because there's some things I picked up that I left out of chapter one. So we should just restart. You know, kind of. And that's what I feel. Now, on the flip side of that, I heard Chuck Swindoll. You guys know who Chuck Swindoll is, right? Great, 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 great Bible teacher. I heard Chuck Swindoll say this. I study more now than I did when I first started. Mm -hmm. And see, and that's what these guys are saying. We can't, we can't leave that because if we leave that, listen, Satan's, Satan's thing is if I can get those apostles sidetracked, I can bring in false doctrine. I can bring in false teaching. No one will know. The word of God's not getting in people's hearts. No one's going to have discernment. And I can get that and I can ruin the church. And you're going, no way, man. We are going to give ourselves to that. And then they say, Pick seven men from among you. Now, i got to be really honest. When I read this, and then I read the estimates of the people, 20,000 people, I think seven ain't enough, right? I think, man, why just seven? You need like 247, you know? You need a, a lot of people, but pick seven men. And then here's what I love. He gives a criteria, and by the way, when they talk about serving tables, that's a word we get deacon from, so we might look at this as the first deacons, although some, some people disagree that it's not, but I kind of think it is, because they're serving tables, but listen, it says, therefore, brethren, first, first thing, first criteria, seek out from among you seven men. The first criteria for somebody to serve as a deacon is they must be born again, from among you, right? He lets them know that. they got to come from among you. And that's important that we understand that. Now, some of us are going, well, duh. Well, some churches don't look at that. They just pick people, you know, by maybe their personality, by maybe their bank account, by maybe other things. He says, no, the first criteria, they got to be from among you. Then, let's look at these criteria, because I think they're good criteria. And then he says, from among you, and then they have to have a good reputation, you see, I think it's important that they have a good reputation in the church, but I think also in the community. What do the people in the community think about that individual? You know, whenever we recognize a deacon, and, and our, our whole philosophy of, of, of that structure of the church is we look for men and women who are doing something, then we recognize them. We don't give somebody an office in hopes that they will do that. We see somebody doing something and recognize what God has already done in their life. 
And when we recognize a deacon, we always bring it before the body and we say, we're getting ready to recognize so-and-so as a deacon. And here's the thing. Do any of you know any reason why he shouldn't be a deacon? Because he's got to be of good reputation. He's got to be of good reputation amongst us and amongst the community. So I think that's important. Oh, by the way, if this is a qualification for a deacon here, I think then it obviously is a qualification for an elder and a pastor and et cetera, right? So you kind of, you know, although those may step up a little bit more, but listen, good reputation, and then I love this, full of the Holy Spirit. Really? All I'm doing is taking my mashed potatoes and putting them on a table, man. I gotta have the Holy Spirit to do that? Yeah. Because as I said, man, if you start serving Jesus and you don't have the Holy Spirit, number one, you're doing it for naught. Number two, you're gonna get worn out. Even if it's just you know, minimal, you're going to get burned out at it. So they have to be full of the Holy Spirit. I believe everybody in any ministry has to be full of the Holy Spirit in order to do that ministry. And by the way, when I think of serving and waiting tables and stuff, I think all I, all I am is I, I'm just a server. All I do is take the word of God that he's cooked up the meal for us, right? He's prepared the meal, and I bring it from the kitchen, and I give it to you guys. That's all I'm doing. I'm just serving you food and trying to keep my thumbs out of the mashed potatoes so as I get it there and get it to you. But listen, that's all we're doing. So then he says, listen, full of the Holy Spirit. And then I love the last one, and they must have wisdom. Wow. That's some great stuff when we think about it. So find seven guys who meet this qualification, and then we'll talk about it. But we are not going to give up what we were called to do. We're not going to get sidetracked from that. In other words, here's the way I interpret that. We're not going to let Satan get a foothold in this ministry. We're on to his schemes. Number one, we're not going to divide. Number two, we're not going to give up getting the word of God into the people of God. So then, here's what I love. Then it says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. I underline that whole sentence in my Bible because that never happens. This saying pleased the whole multitude? I don't know that we've ever done anything in our fellowship that's pleased the whole multitude. There's always a couple holdouts at least. I don't like that. Why did you do that? How come you set the service times at 9 and 11? I liked it better at 8.30 and 10.30. And this saying, please, this is cool. They said one thing, and the whole multitude's going, yes. You know what that tells me? This is a spirit-led decision, right? And that's not saying that ours aren't. I guess that's kind of dangerous. Huh? But listen, listen, the whole multitude is, yes. And then we get some names here. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Wow. Something peculiar about all of those names, I think. They're all Greek names. You see, the wisdom, if the Greeks are feeling cheated, the Hellenists are feeling cheated, Let's make sure the Hellenists are over them. You kind of get what's going on? Make sure they're the guys serving so that we can, listen, I look at this, man, it just puts the fire out immediately, right? You choose seven, we're gonna choose those seven, and don't you, I I love, I love when you see something kind of starting to escalate and build up, and you know, man, you know there's about an explosion to happen, and somebody, by the power, you know, through the power of the Spirit says some, you know, gem of wisdom, and the whole thing goes, and it settles down. And that's what happened in this situation. You know, I, I, I love when you get people like that around you. And you surround. I like to surround people, myself, with people like that. Because I can tend to, like when it gets almost ready to explode, just light the fuse. And watch it explode, you know, and that's not a good thing. So you need that person that can bring it down. And this one decision, man, diffused everything and calmed everybody down. And I think part of that wisdom was the guys they chose. Now, most of us know Stephen, and you know, part of this, listen, part of this, part of Luke including this, I don't think was so much to give us a thing on church government and giftedness, a little bit. 
But part of it was he's making a transition from talking about the early, early church to getting to one individual, Saul of Tarsus. And Stephen is a hinge on which he's going to turn that. The rest of this chapter and all of chapter 7 is about Stephen and how Stephen influenced a young man, Saul. But now that's, that's, that's a little trailer for the next couple weeks. So you keep coming. So you have Stephen, a man full of, the, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Don't you love the idea, full of faith? Wouldn't that be great on your tombstone? Every time I read this section of Acts, I think, that's all I want, you know. If I, if I have a tombstone, I'm planning on getting raptured. But if I don't, all I want is full of faith in the Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's just a great thing. You don't need to know anything else about me. He was just full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, then we know the first martyr. And then we have Philip. You know, Philip is kind of one of my heroes. And here's the thing. It doesn't seem like Stephen and Philip continued on in this ministry of deaconing. It seems like they were more, they were more evangelists, right? Stephen's out. Well, Stephen's got a, just a short, short ministry. He's just got a tiny ministry. But Philip, man, remember Philip is the one who flew from one place to another without an airplane, right? You guys know his story? If you don't, we'll, we'll read it. But like, I think, man, Philip, what a crazy, crazy ministry that guy had. And then the rest of them, we don't even, we don't even hear about them. But they all have Greek names. And the last guy is very interesting. Did you pick up on that, Nicholas? And did you hear what it says? Nicholas was what? A proselyte from Antioch. Nicholas was not even a Jew who was a Hellenist. Nicholas was a Gentile who had become a Jew who is now a Christian. Now that's kind of crazy, huh? So those are the guys they have. And then here's what I love. Look at verse 6. Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So they brought them to the apostles. The apostles recognized them prayed for them, and laid hands on them. I think we need to understand a little bit about that because I believe a lot of people have a misconception of laying on of hands. Laying on of hands in some circles, people act like power goes through that. You know, I'm going to put my hands on you and power is going to come. That's kind of crazy. I've been to those meetings. I've had hands laid on me where the person laying their hands on me starts trembling and moving, and I'm just thinking, I'm a pretty stubborn person. Have you guys noticed? And they start doing that, and they're wanting me to do something, and I'm thinking, ain't going to happen, man. That is not going to happen. I'm not going with the game. And then I, I'm so stubborn, man. If something started to happen, and I started, you know, gyrating, or I felt power like coming out the bottom of my feet, I surely wouldn't tell them. They ain't going to tell you. That's not what laying hands on is all about. Do you know why the apostles laid hands on him? For one reason. We're identifying with these guys. They're part of the ministry. We want you to know, as apostles, as leaders, we identify, we put our hands on them and identify with them. Remember, remember in Exodus, I don't know what chapter, you guys find it. Read the whole book for homework. Remember in Exodus when they brought the, the scapegoat? Remember? They would bring the two goats, and the people would lay their hands on them. They weren't transferring anything. They were identifying. Now I identify with this goat, and he carries my sin out into the wilderness. Then I identify with this goat, and he's slain for my sins. That's all that is. So the apostles, again, aren't transferring power, nor are they transferring authority. Here's what they're doing. We identify with these guys. They're part of the ministry. I, I, I kind of like thinking of it that way better than some, you know, kind of mystical stuff going on. We identify. So here's what the 12 did. We identify with these seven, and we identify with these seven to do the ministry of serving the tables. That's what we called them to do. Now check out, man, verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Saints, when the church is being the church, you know what happens? The word of God spreads. It spreads. I look at this like a mist going through a city. 
And as the church is being the church and those who are called to serve are serving in the areas they're called to serve in and the places God has placed them, it just starts permeating. Here's what kind of blows my mind. This is, this is one of the first times where he said the word of God spread. It started going out from this church. Why? Because people are doing what they're called to do. And now the word of God is spreading. And it says now the, multi, the, the, the disciples are multi, or the number of disciples multiplied. We got more multiplication on top of multiplication. Now I remember in school when you multiplied something and then multiplied that multiple by another multiple, that you're really kind of getting some big numbers, right? Crazy stuff is going on. And they're multiplying greatly in Jerusalem. They're still, listen, they're still in that entity of Jerusalem. They're supposed to go out, and they will, but they're still there. And then, and then this is one of my favorite parts. Check this out. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Excuse me? What just happened? Where were they holding their meetings? You guys remember? In the temple courts. In Solomon's colonnade, Solomon's porch, who's hanging out in the temple the most? Priests, right? They said there was an estimate of 8,000 priests at that time. Remember, they would go and they would have certain times where you serve for a month and then you're off for, a, you know, eight or nine months and serve for a month. Well, you have these priests and these priests are walking by these crackpots every day listening to him say, you know, Jesus died and he rose again on the third day. Jesus died and he rose again on the third day. What was their message? Jesus died and he rose again on the third day. Hey, what are you guys talking about? Jesus dying and raising again on the third day. Why do you guys keep talking about that? Because that's what we're all about, you see. We're not worshiping a dead person. We're worshiping a live person. And Jesus rose on the third day. You know these priests have got to be asking their people over them, hey, what's going on with this whole Jesus raising again on the third day? Can we, like, get his body and shut these guys up? No, we've tried. We can't find a body. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so you can't get a body going, so maybe those priests start talking to each other. Maybe he really did die and raise again on the third day. And he died and raised again on the third day, and now these guys got like, you know, 60,000 people showing, 60,000 people coming and listening to him. And we know, we know that, man, just... You know, a couple months ago, Pete's in, a, Pete's in a courtyard with this little girl who comes up and says, are you one of them? And he goes, no, I'm not one of them. Now this guy's blabbing and blabbing. Maybe something really happened. And then when they go in to change the showbread in the temple, what was the big thing about, about going into the temple, I think, at that time? You go in and change the showbread. Do you know what, well, you know what was going on in the temple? There was this curtain in the back. Do you know about the temple? You had the holy place, and then you had the most holy place, right, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And what separated them? A veil, right? A curtain. Well, you know what was going on then, don't you? Remember when Jesus died? What did it say? The curtain was ripped from the top down. Now, I don't know that you could, you know, uh, tell that. But you go in there, every time you go in there, there's that tear. Hmm. That whole thing is ripped bad. And those guys keep talking about Jesus. And that's ripped. And you talk about Jesus. And that's ripped. And now all of a sudden you got priests going, Wow. Maybe he really was the Messiah. Now you got some real revival going on, huh? Many, did you read that? Many of the priests are now becoming believers. Remember the last couple times I said, how did Luke know what was going on in those meetings that he wasn't part of, nor was Peter and John, they'd kick him out? Maybe some of these guys were, right? So you got now the priests joining in. Here's my conclusion from these seven verses. When we are being the church, not just a group of people coming together, when we are truly being the church of Jesus Christ, the word of God is going to spread. Souls are going to be saved. You know, I read verse 1, I read verse 7, and here's what I hear. A whole bunch of people went from a Christless eternity to being saved and regenerated and eternal life with him. That is good news. That is not just good news. That is great news when it's multitudes of going on. So you and I, that's what we get to be part of in this generation. Listen, it wasn't just for them. I think it's for us right now. So here's what I think we really need to do. Be the church. How has God gifted you? What has he called you to? Hey, number one, if you don't know that, 
Well, first of all, you gotta get saved. We'll give you that opportunity. But if you are saved and you don't know what God's gifted you or called you to, start talking to people. Start asking him. I guarantee you it's not as complicated as you may think it is. God doesn't give you a gift and go, huh, try and figure that one out. (laughs) No. If he gifts you, he's going to show you. Talk to some people. Talk to him. And when you find that calling, listen, Christian, you do that with all of your heart. And you go for it. And man, when as we start being the church of Jesus Christ, the word of God, I just see in my, in my mind, the word of God just going out through Sierra Vista and then, and then it's going down 92 and, and out the other way and, you know, and it's heading out into the world and heading down 90 towards I-10 and then we hit I-10 and, and it's going all over. Kind of get that vision? And the word of God is spreading. Why? Because the church is being the church. So let's do that, huh? Let's stand up and pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, for the challenge here that we see in a simple part of scripture. And God, I pray, I pray that, Lord, we would understand there's no part of the body of Christ that's not important. As a matter of fact, when you speak about it in Corinthians, you talk about, hey, some of the most important parts are covered up or unseen in our physical bodies, and we know that's true spiritually. So I pray that, first and foremost, we would find our gift and then use our gift, whether it's public or whether it's private. But God, that we would do it with all of our hearts. And we would see your word spread throughout Sierra Vista, our county, continuing on into the state and the world. Lord, we we wanna see multitudes coming to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we wanna have happen. So, Lord, I pray that you would encourage our hearts through this message, through this, these seven verses, and empower us to do that ministry that you've called us to do. And I'm going to ask.